Hello, and welcome to Sim Radio here on the Sisters in Music Network. It's Monday Music Madness, and you're tuned into Mixing It with Nikki Chris. This is Nikki, and in case you don't know anything about me, I'm a singer songwriter from Raleigh, North Carolina. My show celebrates women in the music and entertainment industry, providing an avenue for them to showcase their talent. Our motto, Sisters in Music, Together We Are Stronger. My guest today is a singer-songwriter from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the youngest of nine children. She is a multi-instrumentalist and accompanies herself on guitar, piano, and sometimes a harpsicle. She has a Bachelor's of Music in Performance from Temple University, and lately she's been finding her voice and honing her songwriting skills while being mentored by Vance Gilbert and attending Ellis Paul's songwriting retreat. Please join me in welcoming the super, super talented Lisa Jeanette. Welcome to Mixing It, Lisa. How are you? Hey. Thanks, Vicki. I, uh, I don't know if I can live up to all of the things that you just said. <laughs> That's sure uh, you quite can. an introduction. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you on my show. We did an Instagram live and it was so much fun. So I'm really excited to be able to share you a little bit more with everyone, get a little bit more detail into some of the things. Can you tell us about your musical background and how old you were when you started getting into music? Sure, and I am honored to be here. I think this is a great platform for women, and this is awesome. And I saw a lot of the women you've been highlighting, and it's really a great outlet, and I appreciate that you do this sort of thing. That's great. As far as my background, so, oh, sure. It's hard to say exactly when it started because my brothers had guitars, and I always say I timeshared their guitars Well, when they weren't home. So I would sneak away and play their (laughs) guitars, and when they would get home, I'd hand them back. And that's kind of how it started with me. And then I started taking, like, piano lessons at the convent where I went to school (laughs) when I was, like, in third grade. And then it just kept snowballing. And I was in high school. I started playing the double bass and got into classical playing, and that's where I went to Temple, and I studied with Henry Scott from the Philadelphia Orchestra. He's retired now. It was a great training, and I don't regret a thing, and I learned a lot, and at that time, I wanted to be a bass player in the Philadelphia Orchestra. That was like kind of my goal, but then life happened. As I hear people say that all the time. I heard the, when I listened to your show before, I heard someone say that. Life happened. <laughs> life happened, and I sort of needed stability in my life. I was like desiring the stability of a day job. So I got a day job as a temp and then that just kept going. So I still have a day job. For a while I did a singer-songwriter thing after college and it was before internet really, like before, (laughs) I'm that old, but like I, I didn't know how to make an album and I didn't know how to make that happen and I thought it was kind of out of my sphere of of things I would be able to do. I come from poor. I am not <laughs> not uh, from a wealthy family. So I grew up in Kensington and Philadelphia in a row home. It's factory district. So I didn't really know how to make it happen, and I just couldn't at the time. And then it just like, you know, I kind of took like a 20-year hiatus. It didn't do much music at all. And then when I met my husband, he had a house with a, a baby grand piano in it. And when I moved in with him... I just started writing again, and it's like it was sort of like just the piano inspired me. Just living with this piano just started making it happen, and, you know, my husband was like, you have to record these. So my first album, he and I recorded together in our basement, and then the second album, Jellyfish on the Moon, which is kind of, you know, what I'm talking about today, was done in the studio with Glenn Barrett at Morningstar Studios, and that was just a great experience. I'm, like, thrilled that that was able to happen. So that's where I am now. (laughs) Awesome. Well, you mentioned that you started out in the classical realm. And it's actually quite interesting how similar our backgrounds are with the doing the day job thing, stepping away from music, going back to music after many, many years, that type of scenario. Starting out classical, because I actually am a classically trained vocalist. That's how I actually Oh, wow. Oh, that's they, incredible. Yeah. they. Oh, I was being pushed into opera. And, um, wow. You know, I was just like, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, didn't go down that <laughs> path. But 
obviously the music, and we're going to get to Jellyfish on the Moon in just a minute, but, you know, your music is not classical. So how would you describe your music? I love to call it kaleidoscope folk, which is something I made up. (laughs) It means nothing to anybody but me. But I love the idea of kaleidoscope because a kaleidoscope is like it changes. It's, you know, it's colorful. You are able to kind of change it into what you want. So I cross genres a bit. I'm not like specifically folk or specifically jazz or specifically pop. I really cross genres a lot, and I think a lot of people do. We all want to categorize something and say, oh, it's folk, or oh, it's musical theater, or oh, it's pop. But there's so much influence, and with the accessibility of music and all the ways you can listen to music and get influenced, it's just everybody has more than one influence, and and I think that more and more people are kind of branching out to different genres. So it, it's hard for me because it's hard for me to market because there is you know a folk market and you know more of a like indie market, and they're not all like the same thing or the same mm-hmm. people. So that makes it hard to market. I mean, that's the the not so great part. The great part is it's easier to sound a little bit unique or a little bit like it's something that's my own because I'm not singing just like someone that sings this way or that way. Right. Right. Yeah. It's pluses and minuses. I think there's, there's a couple people that are in similar situations as yours. I wouldn't even call it a situation, but uniqueness in crossing the the genre methodology Mm -hmm. and not really being pigeonholed in one space in space and mm-hmm. pluses and minuses as, as you say definitely from a marketing social interaction perspective or even promotion and stuff like that can be a little bit challenging but i do think it makes you unique and you know having heard you do some of these songs live already and then also listening to the album i mean it definitely suits you and i'm glad that you're doing this mess up, if you will, of various different types of genres, because it certainly does suit you and your tone and what I've gathered from the type of things that you write. Do you have or do you pull from like specific musical inspirations or influence or did you for this particular album, Jellyfish on the Moon? Yeah, I always think that's a difficult question because I feel like everybody influences me. Like, everyone I listen to mm-hmm. influences me. So it's, like, hard, but at the same time, so being the youngest of nine, I grew up with three generations of music before me. So my older sisters and brother listen to, like, Motown and that sort of thing. And, you know, you also get your like your parents listen to. My parents were, like, Tommy Dorsey and, like, <laughs> Big Band and, and Tammy Wynette and things like that. And then the middle generation was more into like a folk thing or, you know, Neil Diamond or John Denver or that kind of Jim Croce and Cat Stevens. And then the ones closest to me, my two brothers that are closest to me in age, that, you know, one was into hard rock like Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and the other one was into prog rock like Pink Floyd and that kind of thing. So I had a lot of influences around me all the time with all this different flavors of music that I just, like a sponge, I just sucked up from my siblings. <laughs> So I I think that all, you know, and, and I loved Genesis, I loved Fleetwood Mac, and Billy Joel, I was a big Billy Joel fan, I was a huge fan of I was a huge Barry Manilow fan, <laughs> which I like to call a fan I was a fan and my mother listened to musical theater, so it's like, there's so much that I probably have drawn on through the years that it's hard to answer that question in, in one breath, <laughs> so I, I tend yeah, to go on. I mean- yeah, but it's great because you you did, right? So, I mean, having all of those different types of musical influences, genres, artists, musicians, however you you want to call it, being catapulted into your life made you who you are today, and that is actually one of the reasons why, right? You don't like to pigeonhole yourself, which is great, yeah. which is absolutely fantastic, right? So, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank so, you. Yes. You're welcome. Let's get to Jellyfish on the Moon. What can you tell us about this album and its creative process? 
So Jellyfish on the Moon, the, the actual song is the title song. I took it from a TV show called One Strange Rock, and Will Smith was narrating the show. There was, it was a series. I don't know if it's still going on or not. But they had this segment about how NASA sent these jellyfish into space, not necessarily the moon. I think it was the space shuttle. But they send these jellyfish into space, and then when they brought them back, they could no longer tell up from down. They had evolved. So for some reason, I just resonated with that story because, like, the times I feel like, like, did I come from some foreign place? Because this world makes me topsy turvy. <laughs> you know, it makes me feel like mm-hmm. I don't know up from down. Like sometimes. So that's kind of where that song kind of came from. So that's the title song. And then, you know, the creative process, I was just really writing hard, studying with uh, Vance Gilbert, taking coaching from him, and I would meet with him once a month, and I would, you know, just write songs that we could uh, analyze. So that's kind of how that creative process happened. And then just stories, like I I take from all different kinds of inspiration. And, you know, I took from, I have this thing called my Brahms Trilogy, which is three songs that depicts the love triangle between Johannes Brahms and Clara and Robert Schumann. Each song is in one of their voices. So that was kind of like a creative, creative thing that I didn't even... I didn't intend. It just started that way. And then actually it was really hard. The second one came easily. The, the third one was really hard because it took me a long time to kind of go, okay, what would this person say? Like, how would they feel? You know, my creative process is usually an, an emotion. It's like how something or someone feels and my reaction to it. I love that. Absolutely love that. And I'm starting to hear that a lot from the people that I've been speaking to. And it's very refreshing. Even even a lot of the real young budding songwriters that, Mm -hmm. you know, haven't been doing things a lot, they're like, well, I really want to write meaningful lyrics, which is very different than a lot of what we hear on mainstream radio, Mm -hmm. if you would call it that, today. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of what you hear... I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm like, okay, that doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> you know, yeah, you no. like that? You know, it doesn't even make any sense. It's not even what. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's you not. It's not always about the lyrics for some people. You know, some people just they don't even hear the lyrics, which. You know, I, I I really focus on the lyrics, obviously, as a songwriter, but I think a lot of people just don't. Like, it's more about the music and, and that sort of thing. So I think that's, that's just a different audience, I suppose. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Well, we're going to play a song from the album, but I would like you to tell us a little bit about it. First, we're going to tee up You Don't Look My Way. So give us a little overview of what that song is about. So You Don't Look My Way is one of the songs from the trilogy, and it's in the voice of Robert Schumann. Clara and Robert Schumann were like kind of a power couple back in their day in the uh, mid-19th century, and Clara was a virtuous pianist. She was a composer in her own right. She toured. She was a touring musician. They lived in Germany. She toured England and the Netherlands and Russia. So she had it going. Robert Schumann was her husband and was the kingmaker of his day. If you wanted to get your name known in the musical circles in, in that area, you needed to know him. So Johannes Brahms was told this in his young years, that you need to know Robert Schumann. So he knocked on their door one day and walked in and sat down at the piano and started to play, and Robert Schumann said, wait, let me go get my wife. And he went and got Clara and brought her in, and they were just blown away by him. And then Clara and Johannes Brahms had an attraction for each other, and it kind of created this little triangle. Robert Schumann was okay with it. Robert Schumann, he had like a lot of um, like uh, mental disabilities. Like He was depression, and he tried to kill himself, and j- jumped into the Rhine, and but he loved Brahms, and he trusted Clara, and he was okay that there was this triangle. And Clara was a working woman. She was, like, out there working. She was the bread and butter. Like, Robert was often incapacitated. So Robert probably did not feel the way this song says, but this is how I would feel if my wife, who, by the way, Robert sued her father for her hand. Her father, Clara's father, was um, his mentor and his teacher, and he sued her 
for Clara's hand because Clara's father thought that Robert Schumann wasn't good enough. So to me, if I had gone to such lengths to, to woo someone, to, to have their hand in marriage, and to love them and give them, I think, seven or eight children they had, and then they were, like, attracted to someone else, this song is how I would feel, not necessarily how Robert Schumann would feel. <laughs> Yes, and I completely agree with you on that, and I definitely think that you've captured the essence of that. So we are going to play this for everyone. Here is You Don't Look My Way off the album Jellyfish on the Moon by Lisa Jeanette. So high on your love Came to rely On your love Now I ask why Got a degree In your love Got a paper decree Of your love For eternity But now you don't look my way my knees for your love sued your enemies for your love cut down family trees but now you don't look my way I faced every fear for your love shed salty tears for your love gave my best years Yeah, 
love it. Like I mentioned, I mean, I certainly think that you captured the essence of that particular feeling. And I agree with you. I mean, completely. If, if, if somebody had gone to, you know, that great of a length to, to woo and to, to get the hand of their one and only love, and then all of a sudden they've got googly eyes, if I will, for somebody else, they'd be like, Ugh, what? Yeah. So. yeah, I'm surprised that anyone that's in that. Job. When you lose, oh, thank you. When, when you lose someone's attention, you know, in a relationship or whatever, it's 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 kind of a universal kind of song. It's not just particular to that story, but I mean, I think anyone who loses someone's attention and finds their partner looking to someone else and finding that person more interesting, or you know, I think that this this is kind of a song for that feeling. <laughs> yep, I definitely agree. Definitely. So I want to touch a little bit on, I know that you've already mentioned his name and that you do work with Vance Gilbert, but give us some idea about some of your coaching experiences with Vance, some of the things that that you guys do talk about, maybe if you create constructively in terms of like some type of methodology, or do you kind of just go into things free form? Give us a little bit of idea about some of those experiences. Sure. So I first saw Vance at NERFA, which is the Northeast Folk Regional Folk Alliance. So it is a conference that happens every year. This year they're doing it online. But I had gone that year and didn't really play. I, it was the second year I'd gone, and I was volunteering. I think it was 2019. And I went in late and observed him doing a master class. And so he would ha- bring, like, these people up, and he would they would sing, and then he would stop them and tell them to – he would tweak them. He would just say, you know, try this, try that. And sometimes it was very hard for them to do the thing that he was asking. But when they did it and when they did it right, it just gave me chills. Like they would go from singing a a good song and sounding good to, oh, my gosh, that sounds incredible. And I saw him do this with several different groups and different artists, and I was like, I have to have that. I need that kind of performance coaching. So it took me a year or like eight months. I, I stalked him for eight months, and I finally caught up to him. And I ended up doing it, like I said, once a month. And basically, he will go, and we did this, you know, he's in Boston, I'm outside of Philly. We would do this online, and before there was COVID, we were doing Zoom sessions long before. He basically will go, I'll, you know, I'll bring a song to him, I'll sing it, and he basically we will go line by line and talk about the song and what I'm trying to say and, you know, am I am I hitting the mark or is, is it not coming through? You know, like if it's really hard on the first hearing or in the second hearing, if it's hard on the third hearing, you're probably not, not getting your message across. And then he'll tweak something and say, try it this way and audition that for me and then I, I play and audition that way for him and so it's sort of like this whole process of tearing a song apart. And, you know, there's a lot of times where it's a lot of tearing apart or, you know, there's times where we didn't do that song. Like, it's, it's if it was – that's rare. Usually I get through a song. But um, it's basically just kind of tweaking it. And then sometimes he tweaks a lot. Sometimes he doesn't tweak anything at all. Like, sometimes he's like, you know, it's fine. It's good the way it is. So it, it was a good – training ground for me just because I really never understood the the craft of songwriting. In fact, I recently took a master class with Louise Goffin, who is Carol King and Jerry Goffin's daughter. And I was saying, like, I still don't understand what the craft of songwriting is. And she said, that's the editing. And, you know, when I first met Vance, I didn't know about editing. I was always like, my song, I wrote the song, it's done. I wrote the song in an hour, it's done. And Vance would be like, what, what's so good about being done? You know, like, to me, I was like, all proud of myself that I wrote a song in an hour. And he's like, you know, what's, what's, what's <laughs> with the done? <laughs> So it was like, so, you know, it's kind of taught me. It doesn't have to be done. Like, I can still work on it once I'm done. And I, that whole concept just didn't, never occurred to me that I could keep editing a song and changing things. So that's kind of what happened. And sometimes I'll bring a song back to him, but a lot of times he gives me the gives me his ideas, and I take most of them, if not all. And sometimes I'll bring it back. It, there was one song that I still haven't recorded that I brought back probably like eight times, which that's rare because it was just a really hard song for me to write. But most songs I just take once or twice and then they do get done. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's 
the concept of editing where a song is really never done is actually very, very true. And even after you record it, it's still never done because that is something that I don't think that people actually realize the life of a song or even the ability to go back and and say, you know what, I want to redo that. Even if you've released something previously, I mean, I have I have a couple of songs where I've done like you know X Y Z version, and then I've done an acoustic version, and then I've done a remix, and then I've done this, and I've gone in and I've even re-recorded songs and changed up the lyrics and the re-record. So a song really is never done in that sense, right? Because it's it's always forever moving forward based upon your interpretation of what you created at that point in time. True. That's so true. Yeah, I had to learn that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And well, trust me, I mean, I had to learn that too because I started out just exactly like you were. It's like, okay, great. Wrote this in, you know, 30 minutes. It's done. And you're like, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so I totally get where you're coming from. So you mentioned that you try to put, you know, emotions into your songwriting. Do you always have a personal purpose or end goal in mind when you're actually writing something? I wouldn't say I have an end goal. So often people say, do you write the music first or the lyrics? Like what comes first, the music or the lyrics? And I always say the emotion. Like for me, it's the emotion and the way – to me, songwriting is my catharsis. It's like the way to to define the emotion. Like sometimes I don't even know what the emotion is. I just have this feeling, and I and I want to try to define it. And the songwriting helps me define like what is this thing I'm feeling, and how can I express it? Um, because sometimes I can't express it with just talking about it to someone or or whatever. However, people get their emotions out. For me, the the lyric writing is my catharsis. It's how I get to identify what the emotion is. That's the goal for me. The goal for me is help me identify this emotion I'm having because I don't understand it myself. I absolutely love that. I think that is a fantastic methodology to live by when writing a song. So, With that, this is a great place to take a short break. Here for a word from one of our partners in podcasting, this is Chatting With That. We'll be right back on Mixing It With Nikki Chris here on Sim Radio. Chatting With Nat is a podcast for independent women seeking to speak their truth and to break down barriers. We host honest conversations that help to guide and empower women. Speak your truth and set yourself free. Let your voice be heard. And we're back on Mixing It with Nikki Chris on the Sim Radio Network and my fantastic guest, Lisa Jeanette. If you would like to collaborate with anyone, who would it be and why? Oh, my gosh. That's a tough one. So let me just say right off that I am not good at collaboration. (laughs) I am very much a Lone Ranger. I wish I were better at it because I recently heard I was, there was a panel discussion at one, actually it was a NERFA, a Folk Alliance thing, and I asked the question, what is the best way to build audience? And their answer was collaboration. And it doesn't come naturally to me. I I have a, a personality that is very empathetic. So when I'm with someone, I defer a lot, and I want them to be comfortable, my fire gets, uh, I do it myself, they don't do it to me, I do it myself where my own fire gets kind of uh, put out a little bit, so I am not at my best in working with someone, I wish I were better at it, I want to get better at it, but I tend to like draw it, draw back, like withdraw when I have to, uh, there's been times where I've had to collaborate with someone in a workshop or something like that, and I just let them go, I just you know, line them up and let them go, and then (laughs) I'm just just sort of like an observer and, oh, maybe change that word or something. I'm just not really good at it, and maybe it's that I need to do more of it. But if I had to pick someone to collaborate with, it'd probably be like, I don't know, Jody Mitchell or Stevie Nicks or... Nice, um, nice. Carol King. Carol King, I would love to collaborate with her. But, you know, 
like, how dare I? Like, <laughs> the, the fact that I'm bad at it to begin with, like, if I were, like, in their presence, I would be like, anything you say. <laughs> you know, like, so I don't know if it would work at all. <laughs> it does take getting used to, right? Everyone yeah. has that initial, oh, I want them to be happy methodology. I, I was even like that when I did, like, my first couple collaborations. Mm-hmm very much that way. I have a couple of people that I work with on a regular basis. So, you know, familiarity. And then there are some things that, you know, I don't think that, that I could ever work in like in a Nashville type of group just because it's too cookie cutter for me. And, mm-hmm. you know, with the methodology of whoever's in the room gets songwriting credit and I would be like, well, wait a minute. They didn't even say a word. Why are they getting songwriting credit? <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, I'd be sitting true. there like going, well, wait a minute. They didn't even contribute. What are you talking about? <laughs> but <laughs> that's where it's like, but I actually like collaborating with people. So you should try and do more of it just to, I you know, even get a little bit, little bit more comfortable with it. Because it, I actually do agree that collaborating with other artists, with other individuals, even out of your comfort zone, put it, you know, maybe like a area that you've never even worked in before does open up unique opportunities. Yeah, I, I believe Definitely it. Definitely does. <laughs> yep, yep. So another question that I wanted to ask you was, you know, how does your music fit into your your local scene, right? Obviously, I, I believe you're still in the Philadelphia area. Mm-hmm. So does your music fit into the local scene there? And if so, how do you take advantage of that? So there is a very strong network of songwriters in the Philadelphia area and Philadelphia and surrounding areas, you know, depending on the Delaware and Jersey as well. They are the most supportive group of people. Uh, the, the songwriters that I've encountered, and there's a couple different groups and a couple different pockets, but they're all the most supportive people, the most encouraging people, and they make you fit in. Open arms embrace you and make you fit in, and I've had nothing but good feelings and reactions from the Philadelphia songwriting community. There's a lot of it and it's all good. So, you know, in that way, so I've, you know, had people ask me to open for them, which was a delight. And, you know, in that way, I've had collaboration where, you know, I did gain some of their audience sometimes when that happens. Basically, it's a, it's a great scene. I don't do a lot of playing out, like live playing. I did a lot, actually in 2019, I did like tons of festivals in this area, like just crazy, and to the fact where it had my head spinning, it was it was a little bit too much, honestly, but, you know, this, of course, since COVID, I haven't done any of that, but that's kind of the most playing I've done is, like, festivals, and every once in a while, I, I'll get a gig somewhere, but it, it's, uh, I don't do a lot of, a lot of, like, playing or touring, because I do have a day job, and it's it's not an easy job. It's like, you know, it's something that I have to put my mind to and it takes a it takes my creative creative energy out sometimes. It's hard to balance both, but I guess you probably have to do that too if you also have a day job where you're trying to balance how much can I do? Like how much performing can I do? How much recording can I do when you have these other things to to, to weigh in and, and balance. Yeah, I mean it's one of those things where I like I like to tell people I am like pencil I <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's one of can you know, I have, I, I'm married, so I, you know, as well, right? And I have kids, and I do sisters in music. I do my own music. I do 15 million other things. So it's challenging. And also, too, especially COVID started shutting things down and as well. I know a lot of people are doing the live streaming thing. I chose to do the podcasting thing. I guess that's my live streaming contribution, if if you will, rather than live concerts and stuff like that. But I'm glad to hear that you are going out and doing a couple of things because I do think that your music is very audience and family friendly. You mentioned you're doing that festival again. I think you've got that local festival, right, that you're doing? The Philadelphia Folk Festival, I, they kind of really changed that up this year. Like, it's very different. So I was supposed to play that this year, but I think that's maybe next year I'll, I'll have a better opportunity because they next really year. 
skimmed it down, yeah, to, to like a two-day event. It's not at the same place. So, yeah, so that'll probably hopefully be next year. But I agree. It's like fun to play. And I, I think if it weren't for quarantine, I wouldn't have gotten the album done because I basically – run too much like it sounds like you just have a lot going on and I'm kind of the same way like I have a church gig that I just resigned from because it was just you know I'm the sort of person that fills up my days and nights and then and then there's nothing left you know it's like so I think it, especially when you have kids I, I don't have kids I do have a husband but I think it's a lot and COVID slowed me down like it was like you know there's nowhere to go so it helped me focus on well what is my priority and and then ended up being the album so that's how that got done if, if it weren't for quarantine I'm not sure what happened <laughs> I've heard quite a few people say that definitely definitely the mm-hmm. slow down aspect allowed them to complete several things so yeah. I'm glad that you were able to slow down and complete it so we are going to talk about the second song that you brought to share with you, and I'm biased. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> Love. It is. It is. I just I, I just think. Thank you. So I know the concept, listeners. I think the concept is brilliant. So <laughs> before we talk about it, though, real quick, I do ask all of my songwriters to share a tip or trick that they've learned or a piece of advice that they would like to share and pass on. So tip or trick before we get into don't blame me. My tip is to get coaching. And and to to me, it doesn't have to be the person I'm using, Vance Gilbert, but find someone you click with. Like, so I, I, I'll tell you really quick, I was a big Christine Lavin fan and uh, growing up and uh i got to meet her at a norfolk conference and i love her music but you kind of when you love someone's music you expect them to love yours back and and not i don't think she's even heard my music but we did not click like we did not click the way vance and i click and i think that you have to find someone that you click with and not to be too disappointed if you don't click with the first person you're seeking out um because i really would have loved her to mentor me you know like but it didn't happen it just there was there's there wasn't an energy there for that so my advice is to be patient but find someone that you trust that can coach you fantastic advice love that and i agree 110 percent we all have coaches we all have mentors and i i think that's great i mean how are we going to learn otherwise right Um, right right. nobody knows everything at least that's that's what i say i mean i still learn i I learned, and one of the key, I'll give you a little caveat or a little insight. There is a reason why I ask that question. I ask that question because I never know what somebody's going to say, and I actually they take up a different trick, <laughs> right? So, oh, I mean, awesome. it's like twofold. It's like one of those things where it's like, okay, well, what can you share? And, you know, and I've gotten some, some really great things where it's like, oh, my God, I've never even thought of doing that, right? So it's it's really, really great. So. That's cool. A little insight to my little sneaky question. All right. (laughs) I want to talk about Don't Blame Me, Jolene's reply. So, again, like I said, I love the story around this one. So can you share it with our listeners? What inspired this song? So totally inspired by Dolly Parton's Jolene, which if you don't know it, look it up. It's a great song. And basically I had a meme that I posted on Facebook, and it was a picture of Dolly Parton, and it said, feeling cute, think I'll kick Jolene's ass. <laughs> and it was just like a funny meme. So I put it on Facebook, and a, a fellow singer-songwriter in the Philly community said to me, or, or posted, I think you should write the reply to this song. And normally, I am terrible at prompts. Like like I said, I get an emotion, and I want to, like, so when someone tells me, write a song about a blue truck, I, I have a really hard time, or, or like any kind of prompt is just hard for me. But for some reason, this one clicked, and as I wrote the song, it evolved into a bigger idea than it began with. <laughs> I love this song. You played it live for us on the IG Live, so if y'all missed it, go check it out on our Instagram page because there is a live version of this. But we're going to pop this in right now. This is Don't Blame Me, Jolene's Reply off the album Jellyfish on the Moon by Lisa Jeanette. Jolene, who takes the blame, I hear you yodeling my name Every single time you get the chance You 
declare that I'm the one who came along and spoiled your fun. You're just using me for your snake dance. Don't blame me. Some say you're the finest woman they've ever seen. I don't want to compete with you. I don't want your man. Your man wants me. song you sing is such a fraud You spin your tail like Scheherazade As if your live nor dying depends on me Your imaginings put me through hell The truth is stranger than the story you tell Listen up, the truth will set you free Don't blame me Some say you're the finest woman they've ever seen I don't want to compete with you I don't want your man, your man wants me Situations finally seen. If you didn't think I'd done you wrong, I bet we would get along. We have more in common than it seems. Don't blame me. Some say you're the finest woman they've ever seen. I don't want to compete with you. I don't want your man. Your man wants me. And we are back on Mixing It with Nikki Chris. That was Don't Blame Me, Jolene's Ref- I love that song. I really do love it. And I love the concept. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant thing. And that is actually one of my songwriting tips and tricks is to take a song and write a reply to it. So, ah, that is a good love one. Love the that fact. Love to see that in action. So fantastic. And it is one of my favorites. And Thank your you live so version that you did was fantastic. Great, too. So kudos. Congrats on that. So Thank before you. we close things, you're welcome. Before we close things out, what is next for Lisa? New music on the horizon? Anything coming down the pipe? Anything that you want to share with our listeners? I have about three albums already written. I have quite a lot of songs that I want to record. The next album I do, I've been thinking about using like a jazz trio to do it. I'm not sure if that'll work or not, but that was kind of like a concept I have for some of my songs that I've written that are kind of more in a like a classic, like a standard kind of song. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I do have more to come. <laughs> Excellent. Where can they find you on social media? I'm pretty much everywhere on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and my my website, lisajeanette.com, is where you can get all my mailing lists, you can buy my album. Um, it's, it's also on all the streaming services, so Pandora, Spotify, Amazon, whatever. It's, it's all over the place, so <laughs> it's pretty easy to find. Excellent. Well, we will make sure to tag your website and some of your social links. Until then, Lisa... Thank you so, so much for joining me. It really has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I'm so glad I have been able to share you with everyone. Y'all, thanks for tuning in for Mixing It. On behalf of everyone at STEM Radio, this is Nikki Chris. Till next time, keep 
on mixing it.